So Lackadal, um, as a building, was constructed um, in the late 1950s. Uh, originally constructed under the auspices of the Metropolitan Borough of Camberwell, so it was subject to the London Building Acts of 1930-1939. Um, it was considered a state-of-the-art building when it was built. Um, actually featured in the Architects' Journal and considered to be one of the most successful applications of fire safety knowledge at the time of its construction. Um, that being said, during the course of its life, um, it underwent a number of refurbishments, as is the norm for buildings of this sort of age and type. Uh, most notably, a refurbishment in the 1980s to introduce a new central heating system resulted in the uh, introduction of uh, suspended ceilings in the corridors that you can see here, which I'll come on to later. Some security doors were introduced in the 1990s. Uh, these had implications for ventilation of the building, which again I'll come on to in a bit. And then finally, a lot of, a lot of talk about the, um, the incident that occurred was around the major refurbishment that occurred in 2006-2007. And the building was a, a social housing block, so um, government owned and, and majority of the, uh, the tenants were social housing tenants with a, a few leasehold tenants also in the property. The building had a total of 16 storeys, of which there were 14 accommodation storeys and undercroft and a plant level. Um, Access was via corridors on odd-numbered floors. I'm going to refer to flats throughout this presentation, but actually there were uh, two-storey maisonettes. Um, so you had corridors on every other floor providing access to one floor of the maisonette, and escape balconies on the other floor of the maisonette providing emergency egress. Um, and all of that fed back into a single staircase which served the building, um, and a couple of lifts, uh, only one of which was working at the time of the fire as it was undergoing uh, repair, refurbishment work, um, routine stuff, um, but it, it did have implications for the course of the incident. Um, and as I mentioned already, in terms of the, the installation of security doors, the building was cross-ventilated. Um, cross-ventilation was something which was commonplace um, at the time of Lackinall's construction. It basically meant that you introduced large open vents in the common spaces at the ends of corridors, the idea being that air movements around the building, wind and so on, would provide smoke clearance. You didn't go with um, compartmentation, you hoped that. Well, the, the assumption was that there would be so much fresh air moving around the building that any smoke produced by a fire would be overwhelmed by the fresh air and therefore you maintain a safe means of escape. That fell out of favour, uh, I think, during the 70s and 80s as a result of some work that, that DRE did. Um, and so it's something that's no longer favoured. But the uh, UK regulatory framework being what it is, you do have the option of maintaining um, pre-existing fire safety measures even if they've fallen out of, of uh, uh, modifications to guidance. The ground floor of Lackinall with an undercroft that housed, housed a boiler house at one end and some storage areas at the other. And here you can see the base of the single staircase to the building. The base of the single staircase, incidentally, was open to the elements. There, was, uh, there were no doors at the base of the staircase. There were, however, doors that um, sealed it off from the lobbies, and indeed there was no opening at the top. So you had a, a vertical shaft open at the base and ostensibly closed at all other floors in the building. Um, although the absence of smoke seals around doors did have implications again for, for smoke. Six people died in the fire at Lackland House, five in the bathroom of flat 81, and one in the living area of flat 79. Between January and March this year, the jury was called to listen to the evidence and to determine the circumstances of the deaths of those six people. The jury sat through <coughs> nearly 12 weeks of evidence, identified a number of factors that contributed to the deaths, and then presented their written findings. The coroner determined from these findings under Rule 43 that there were three organisations that had the power to take action to prevent the occurrence of or continuation of such circumstances or to eliminate or reduce the risk of death created by such circumstances. This presentation looks at the recommendations made to the London Fire Brigade. The coroner also acknowledged that a number of changes had been made by the London Fire Brigade. Other than that, the coroner made, some, uh, made five recommendations where she did make comment. These related to the use of incident commanders, comments around brigade control, communications, general familiarisation visits, and home fire safety visits pursuant to the 72D of the Fire and Rescue Services Act and public awareness of fire safety. There are some key times that may help in understanding both the difficulties the fire crews were faced with and why the jury 
may have seen these as important in reaching their conclusions. They're not all the key or important times, but ones I've selected to set the scene. We've heard that the first call was made at 16, 19 hours to a fire in flat 65. Two minutes later, the occupant of flat 79, Catherine Hickman, made her call to brigade control. 16.24, time of arrival of the first appliance. 16.25, six minutes after the first call, flash over in flat 65. 16.30, Bridgehead was established on the seventh floor. At the same time, fire entered flat 79. 16.35, firefighters reach flat 65. 16.40, 21 minutes after the first call, was possibly the last opportunity that Catherine Hickman had to escape. 16.47, fire was seen developing in flat 53 on the seventh floor and flat 37 on the fifth floor. 16.49, 30 minutes after the first call, the last sounds were heard from Catherine Hickman. 1650, the bridgehead was compromised and eventually relocated to the ground floor. Conditions at that time also, conditions on the upper floor of flat 79 were no longer survivable. 1715 was the last opportunity for occupants of flat 81 to escape using the balcony on the east side of the building. 1719, 60 minutes after the first call, the fourth incident commander took over. 1820, 121 minutes after the first call, the deceased in flat 81 were located. 2051, 212 minutes after the first call, the deceased Catherine Hickman in flat 79 was located. The evidence was given that dramatically described how fire crews were caught by unexpected fire development and multiple requests for Rescue. Initial actions by the first arriving crews went to plan. The riser was charged and a bridgehead was established in the lift lobby and stairwell on level 7, two floors below the fire floor, and firefighting commenced. As crews were advancing via the common corridor into the flat of origin on the ninth floor, fire was seen to spread externally to involve flat 79 immediately above. And flat 53 and on the 7th and flat 37 on the 5th floor. From about this time, crews began facing unexpected fire development and a large number of rescues across multiple floors. All this was coupled with an unusual layout of the flats and confusing floor and flat numbering. With the increasing appliance attendance, uh, the incident Commanders were changing rapidly as more senior officers arrived to take command in accordance with policy and procedure. The first incident commander was in command for six minutes, the second for 27 minutes, the third for 23 minutes, the fourth for four minutes, the fifth for 57 minutes, and then we went into the sixth one who was the final incident commander during that part of that phase of the firefight. In fairness, these times may not be completely accurate, but by the times that were recorded, an actual handover may have, accorded, uh, may have occurred earlier or later in, in these times, but they serve to illustrate the point. By about 1840, there were over 18 pumps, aerial ladder platforms, and fire rescue units, plus many other vehicles on scene. So it's against this background that the coroner made her recommendations for the fire. I will discuss how some of the evidence may have led to these recommendations. There were six incident commanders during this period of the fire, serving for, some only serving for brief, brief periods. This raised to the coroner the effectiveness of tying the choice of incident commander to the number of appliances attending an incident. There were times when the make pumps message resulted in an increased response of two pumps. As the total number then required the attendance of a more senior officer, a change of incident commander occurred. 
and the effective use of the relieved incident commander did not always occur.